Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Wisconsin Eye on the campus of Chippewa Valley Technical College. Rich Postlewaite is a Democrat from Eau Claire running in the 91st District. Rich, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. That's great. I'm glad to be here. Thank now, you. you were a business agent for both WEAC and the Teamsters for 15 years. Correct. Labor issues, union issues, top priority or up there but not quite the top? It's up there but not, not, uh, not the top issue. Um, it's it's an important issue, you know, with Act 10 coming along and the removal of collective bargaining rights across the state has definitely seen a dwindling of the enrollment in the union membership. But uh, that would be something I would look at changing if I was elected to office. But my top issue is the opioid crisis. I've had two children go through this. They're doing great now, but that's been kind of my key it's issue. Kind that of I've, a knock on wood It's, time, an, it's a home. It hit home. As Representative Nigerin has learned painfully. Excuse yes. me, go ahead. No, yes. And so... Uh, the two children are doing great. One's getting married 10 days after the primary in New York. August 14th. <laughs> yep. And uh, so we're, uh, that's been an issue, and my children have been very beneficial in the sense that I asked them what they went through and how did we react, and, and treatment was so important, and less incarceration. I know the one had to do a little jail, but it was good. You know, he needed that. The other one, no, but the less incarceration, this is a, an issue that we can't be locking all these people up. We should be treating these people and, and trying to find out the root of why people do this. Well, so that's really a key part of your campaign? Yes. Criminal justice changes Correct. to the system? Yes. And what, sp what specific changes? We've got a lot of issues, but give me a short version of... Um, Eau Claire has a great drug court. We've got this wonderful drug court that's been around for about 15 years. I'd like to expand that statewide. Um, not, from my understanding, not all counties have it, and particularly my understanding, Milwaukee has very little of it. And now, granted, that's not going to endear myself with the voters of Eau Claire necessarily on an issue of Eau Claire, mm -hmm. but it's something that I feel strongly about. And somehow changing the idea of locking everybody up into into rehabilitation, and to somehow having people get treatment for these for these illnesses. If someone's in prison now for nonviolent marijuana possession or drug possession, do you think they should be let out? Yes. You do. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about healthcare in rural areas. Okay. Older demographics. Lower household income than the rest of the state, right. and a, a problem finding providers. Right. W what's your thought on how to continue and maintain and improve healthcare in rural areas? Well, I wish I had my son here. He's, this is one of his big issues in Madison. He goes to school in Madison. Um, he he talks about some of the delivery the delivery of it being the major problem, like you had mentioned. I don't know if there's a magic wand to fix this to fix this issue. I know that some programs, my one other, another son is looking at doing a dental program and then getting his student loans, what, where he, if he ever takes them, after five years in rural dentistry. Mm -hmm. So that's one health care aspect of the dentistry. I don't have a magic wand. I wish I did. You know, the, the, the hospitals are centralizing. You know, you've got Eau Claire's got the Mayo Clinic and Sacred Heart and the Marshfield Clinic, so we've got a lot of variety with health care providing here in Eau Claire. And I know that the Mayo Clinic has like a branch in Osseo and a branch in Barron, but they can't have a branch in every little city. That, that's the problem, is the finances of it. So I wish I had a magic wand. I'd write a book and make a million. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's an ongoing controversy, and I would like to try to address that as a, as a member of the State Assembly. Do you think the state, state government has a role in helping to recruit and re retain more health care providers? I don't know if the state has a role in that. I think like the tech college, you know, as an institution providing those, that type of education. And so if the state, by helping through the education, current educational facilities would, would do that, you could use that as a role. But I wouldn't say the state should take an active role in recruiting, going out and finding people. It's more of a free market dilemma with pay and education. Tell me about the 91st District. You've lived in it a long time. Yeah, most what of are, my life. What are its biggest, biggest needs other than we've talked about some of the Healthcare issues, other needs of the 91st? Uh, quality educated people for the workforce, you know, and recruiting young people. We've done 
Eau Claire's grown tremendously just in the last five years. If you go downtown five years ago and look at it today, mm -hmm. if you hadn't been here in a while, you would see a totally different city. So I know they're recruiting people from outside the area to come in here, and that's always a benefit because a lot of people get their degree from UW Eau Claire or CBTC, and then they move out of the area. They might move to Minneapolis, I used to call that the $2 river because wages are always $2 more no matter what job you have over there in the Twin Cities. So I see quality education. And you just said that Wisconsin should raise its minimum wage. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one because, you know, being an economist, um, I'm a free market person in supply and demand. And if you try to raise the minimum wage, the problem I have with that is that if you own a business in Madison that's very successful, the market is probably already dictating you have to pay more. Mm -hmm. But if I own a resort and I'm only open four months a year up in Rhinelander, and you're telling me you have to pay $15 an hour, that's going to be a real strap for me to make ends meet in my business. So a statewide minimum wage is, is it, I, I think it's something to look at, but it's, it's something that can be very different. Minneapolis raised their minimum wage, the Minnesota did, but you've got, what, three quarters to more of the population centered around two large cities. Where Eau Claire, Eau Claire's different than Milwaukee's, different than Madison's, different than Green Bay, different than Rhinelander, you know, where it's also different all around the state. I forgot to ask you this when you talked about your history as a, as a labor organizer. Do we need to completely reverse Act 10, both provisions, collective bargaining and making pub public employees pay more for health care and pensions? Well, I would say allow collective bargaining, this attack on collective bargaining to begin with. Whether you repeal Act 10 or not is a big step, and with the current structure of the government, it's probably not going to happen, no matter who gets elected in the 91st Assembly seat. Mm -hmm. um, but allowing people to collectively bargain, I don't, I don't go along with the argument that somebody doesn't have the right to free speech if they are forced to join a union because the union stands for something they don't like. Well, if you're going to receive the benefits that are going to be bargained into a contract, then you should pay your fair share. So I would like to see collective bargaining expanded in the state of Wisconsin and let people have a choice to do that. The impasse in the capital over transportation, highway funding, how would you solve it? How would you like to see it solved? Well, I wouldn't have eliminated the increase in gas tax tied to inflation. The indexing. The indexing. 2006, yeah. yes. Yes, when they eliminated that, I thought that was, it had been around a long time, and the idea was that people won't, um, they won't notice because gas prices go up and down so much so that if the taxes incrementally increased year after year in small amounts, people will notice. Now, I know it's a regressive tax. It, it, it hits the poor harder than it hits the wealthier, but you have so many more people paying into that gas tax, and everybody needs gas to go to work and to go see their family or to do whatever they do. So I know it's regressive in nature, but it can generate so much more money by increasing the, the sales tax, the excise tax on gas. So go back to indexing. Do you also want to raise the gas tax or raise the $75 you and I pay to register our car? And what about tolling? Those three other transportation issues. I'm not a fan of tolling. And besides, you have to get a waiver from the federal government. And that, that my understanding is it's a year to process to even to, to get the waiver. I'm not, we've always been good in Wisconsin about not having tolling. Um, I understand my daughter lives in Indiana, so we go on to visit her. It's pretty convenient now. You get the pass, and boom, you're underneath it. But that's expensive to set up, and I know that's one issue that, we'll, that people will look at. Um, I, vehicle registration is fine where it is, but I would say incremental increases in the gas tax. Once again, I know it's regressive, but that's one way to fund it. How many pennies would you go for? I would begin with probably about a 7 to $0.10 cent increase in the excise tax. Okay. Local governments have been um, living with levy limits since 2006. Your thoughts on whether they should be those levy limits loosened or done away with? Loosened, I don't know about doing away with because what happens at the local level of the community is that so I've got a tax base. We want to we want to improve our school. The roof is leaking or we want to increase salary because we're trying to recruit new math teachers or science teachers or whatever it would be. So we need to be competitive in our pricing and think about it trying to get t teachers, particularly these rural school districts, is very difficult. So some change in the formula, I'm not up for completely eliminating it and letting, letting municipalities, school districts, and cities uh, raise property taxes any level that they want. Now, granted, the taxpayers would choose them, whether to unelect them you know, in the yeah. next election or not. Yep. But I'm not for just letting communities go willy-nilly, so to speak, you know, wherever they want with the tax base. Most would be fiscally responsible, I'm sure. But some restrictions, and I, I don't have a grasp of every simple answer to that, you know. I, 
but it would be something I would look at. UW System Funding. Now, you teach on which campus? Stout. Okay. We're in Menominee, yeah. Um, as you're well aware, then, we're in the sixth year of a freeze on resident Correct. undergraduate tuition. Yeah. Should we continue that into a seventh and eighth year, or is it time to no longer freeze tuition? I think the, I think the intent by the state legislature has, has had it, they've had their intent and has succeeded. So I've watched a lot of people retire over at Stout, and I watched a lot of people that don't have a job anymore, and they can't cut anymore. They are at bare bones over there. We're all teaching 35 to 40 kids in class. It, they, we can't cut anymore. So I would look at a the stop the, the tuition freeze and maybe encourage or have some kind of a set model for schools to increase the tuition with the Board of Regents, of course. Let's talk about K-12 public school funding. Um, is the state spending enough on, on K-12, our public school system, or do we need to significantly increase it? Well, I think we need to increase it. What, what I see as a trend in the future is urban versus rural school districts. So you've got these rural school districts out there with declining enrollment. You know, maintenance, they need maintenance. Some of the school buildings are quite old. How do we deal with that? Now, do we increase the funding to those school districts as they're decreasing their enrollment? How do we balance the two? And then you've got school districts with increasing enrollment where the system's okay to them, but whatever portion that they receive from the state, you know, the, it's whatever portion that, that individual school districts get, and that's always delayed too. So you have to, you have to take into consideration when they need the money and how that money gets to those school districts. How do we deal with these rural school districts with declining enrollment? They want to stay open. They have pride, proud, you know, they pride, have pride. And how do we keep them open or is there some point where they have to merge with other school districts? That is a, ultimately a decision of these individual school districts. Uh, it's got to be tough. You know, here you have pride in your community all these years, and you're on the school board, and you're 60 years old, and you're watching the declining enrollment. How can we pay to keep this open? I, I don't have, once again, an, an easy answer for that, but some kind of funding to keep them open if it's viable. Well, would you support some type of a... a tax increase to provide more aid to K-12 public schools? The popular tone these days isn't tax increases. The population, no matter what side of the aisle you talk to, tax increases are something that you're going to get beat up on by your opponent if, if, if they choose to do that and as far as an election is concerned. Mm -hmm. So it's not this thing, well, I want to raise taxes here, I want to raise taxes there. I, I don't think that's the ultimate answer. Um, I would have to look at individual initiatives that come forward with the legislature, like let's say there's a movement, people are talking about this or talking about that. I wouldn't be no tax increase, no tax increase, no, no tax increase. I wouldn't be, that wouldn't be my philosophy. Okay. It'd be take a look at what we've got and how to move forward. The Choice, the voucher program has grown, started out in Milwaukee, then Racine, now statewide. Your right. position on Choice? Well, I think the schools that receive the money should be more open about their books and where, where they get the money, how much money they're getting and where they're getting the money from. And also, to a certain extent, those schools, then a lot of them are exempt from the te teacher licensing process. That should be looked at as well. I'm not opposed to them. I don't think it's a terrible idea and we should never do it. I'm sure it, pro it provides a good education for a lot of people that may not always have it. But I think they should be more open and we should be more open about the process of how they get that funding. With the backdrop of mass shootings and school shootings, do we need to change our gun laws? Well, that's a tough one, particularly in a state like Wisconsin, where the deer hunting and hunting in general is a big tradition. Um, you know, popular opinion appears to be for a waiting period. Popular opinion is, is strongly for background checks. So are those systems effective? I have, I have never bought a gun myself, so I, I, I don't know the process. I just talk to friends that are gun owners, and they tell me you know, this and that, and the laws have changed recently in Wisconsin now that's very easy to get a weapon in Wisconsin. Um, but I don't, I vast, the poll after poll is showing that people are open for waiting periods and for stronger background checks. What that means, I'm not familiar with how the system works per se, but you hear people that say, well, let's make sure the system is working. And I would be looking into that as well. What about the, uh Four billion in tax incentives for Foxconn. That's state and local incentives. Right. Would you have voted for that? No, I would not have voted for that. Why? Well, I believe in economic incentives from the government to help a business like that. But I just feel that a big part of the state was not represented in that. That the, 
we just simply were told this is what's going to happen, particularly this part of the state up here, northwest Wisconsin, you know, Eau Claire and surrounding communities. I think the citizens here are like, we're glad the state's doing something to create jobs. That, that's, that's all fine and dandy. But we're going to end up paying some of our tax dollars is going to go for that. And what do we get in return? And maybe a couple of contractors from here will get a subcontract out of the deal. But for the most part, it, it, I don't see it benefiting a large portion of the state. What's your position on both medical marijuana and recreational, le legalizing recreational marijuana? Well, if we have this big opioid problem, I don't think we should be spending a lot of time on enforcing a, a minor drug possession such as with marijuana. Whether you want to come out and say that it should be a recreational use, I don't know if Wisconsin's ready for that yet. Um, a slower step might be like what Michigan has done, where they met, they try it first with the medical marijuana mm -hmm. and then see if that works. I would like to see a referendum to the voters. That would be very interesting to see how the voters would feel about something like that. So I wouldn't come out and say, let's legalize it for everybody, but incremental steps again, let's try the medical marijuana. I think people spending time in prison for that is ridiculous. It's a nonviolent criminal, nonviolent criminal activity. People going to prison for that, and Wisconsin's good. I mean, I don't know enough about Milwaukee, but most places around uh, Wisconsin, the judges look at that as, "Well, I'm not going to throw you in prison for this. You know, you're going to pay a fine, and you're you're, you're not going to go to prison, maybe jail for a few days." But the, I don't think that we should necessarily open it up for everybody and and have, make it. Uh, uh, recreational use, but at least take a step towards medical marijuana use. Final question. The um, 91st is an open seat with Representative Walks running for governor. Correct. Um, so it's a crowded primary. Yeah. You want to highlight any differences between you and your opponents in the primary? Well, I don't want to. We all like each other. We're all nice to each other. We're not the best of friends, but we, we get along. I would just say with my experience with negotiating contracts, I've negotiated over 200 contracts in my years in the labor union. I know how to negotiate contracts. I know how to handle grievances. I know I, I know how this how this system works, and that relates very well to government work as far as a politician is concerned. And I bring this personal passion into with this opioid crisis because I watched two kids go through this. It was painful, and I tear up thinking about it. But I'm happy now that they're doing great, and they're both doing great. And actually, we're having a shower for my daughter this weekend, so I'm cleaning the house. <laughs> <laughs> the to-do list is quite long. And then so we're having a shower here in Eau Claire. And then, like I said, the wedding is in New York uh, eight days after, ten days after the election. We, we, t we take off for New York for a few days. Thank you. Rich Post, the weight of Eau Claire, is a Democrat running in the 91st Assembly District. The primary is August 14th. Rich, thank you for talking to Wisconsin. Thank you for the invite. I enjoyed it. Thank you.